Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're live from the farm today at the Johnson County Historic Poor Farm, home of the Iowa Valley RC&Ds Grow Johnson County program. My name is Jorgen Rose. I'm with Practical Farmers of Iowa. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Nick, Emma, and Maggie, with Megan and Jason behind the scenes helping us out on the tech. We're here today, uh, live from the farm, to talk with Jake Kundert, who's the Food Systems Director for the Iowa Valley RC&D, about some of the work that they're doing here at the Poor Farm, not only to benefit uh, pollinators and beneficial insects, but also to help with pest control and benefit crop production. We're also going to talk with Sarah Nizzi, who is a Farm Bill Pollinator Conservation Planner and Partner Biologist with the Xerxes Society. She's going to talk with us today about some pollinator and insect conservation strategies and habitat management on the farm. It is a beautiful, balmy day here on the farm today. We're glad you could join us live from the farm. Um, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Feel free to say hello. Uh, also feel free as we go to type your questions into the YouTube chat and we'll make sure to get those answered and worked into the conversation as we go. Jake, thanks for being here. I think uh, we'll start out, why don't you tell us a little bit about the about the poor farm and, and uh, what you grow here. Yeah, so the poor farm is a 160 acre property uh, right here within Iowa City limits. It's owned by, the, by Johnson County and it's been owned since, by the county since the mid 1800s. Uh, in the past maybe five to 10 years, the county's been looking about how we can be better using this property to be benefiting the community. And so Grow Johnson County uh, began renting land from the county in uh, 2016. And we grow organic fruits and vegetables that we donate to hunger relief agencies in Johnson County. And then we provide educational opportunities for people that want to learn more about sustainable food production. Um, so in 2019, we started working with uh, Xerxes to be implementing these beetle banks on the farm. And the year before that, there was a pollinator habitat seeded um, here on at kind of a larger section of the property. And we're gonna look at both of those today. Great. Sarah, you wanna tell us a little bit about Xerxes Society and what you do as a farm bill pollinator conservation planner and partner biologist? Yeah, so my name is Sarah Nizzi. I am the only uh, Iowa Xerces employee. We're an international nonprofit organization that works to preserve wildlife through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. We're based out of Portland, Oregon. We have about 50 people on staff and about half of those uh, work for the pollinator team, like myself. As a Natural Resource Conservation Service NRCS partner biologist, I work with that federal agency to implement habitat on private land. So working with producers and landowners, anyone interested in pollinator habitat, as well as training their staff on all things pollinator related, whether that be seed mixes, management, um, site prep for native plantings, updating technical guides, et cetera. We do a ton of education and outreach such as this. And yeah, in 2019, we partnered with Grow Johnson County um, because they were interested in implementing beneficial insect habitat. So we are gonna be deep diving into beetle banks today, which beautifully is right behind <laughs> us. Yeah, so maybe Jake, tell us a little bit about what we're looking at here. I mean, Sarah just called this a beetle bank. Uh, yep. Maybe we can get a shot to show how long it is. Yeah, so the beetle banks, we put in uh, four, four different kind of sections in uh, 2019. Uh, these ones that we're next to here are 425 feet long. Um, they're three rows, which we'll get into maybe in a little bit. Uh, three rows of planting. Uh, the rows are about 15 inches apart. And then within rows, the spacing of the plants is about a foot. Um, they're five foot wide. And we kind of uh, used, a, we used a bed former when we were tilling and prepping the ground. So it kind of creates this berm type shape where they're a little bit elevated off the rest of the ground. And the main idea with these is they're as close to the field, the production field as, as they can be, because beetles only travel so far. So you want to really make sure that their habitat is as close to the, the space where you want them to do work for you and as possible. So they're, you know, right adjacent to the fields. There's, there's a, a, two fields of potatoes here right next to us. Um, and luckily aren't being devoured by potato beetles. So <laughs> that's good for the shot. And hopefully there's some uh, good, good beetles in here doing some work for us already. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say is just this section that we're in front of here is we, um, based on the design that we worked with, uh, with Sarah and Sarah Foltz Jordan, both, who both work at Xerxes, the design was to have kind of a tall stature plant section in the middle, and then both outside sections would be shorter stature native plants. And so that was just so that the shorter stature plants would have just an opportunity to not be outcompeted by the big ones. So this is a bunch of big blue stem right here in front of us. And then there's some other, uh, the forbs that are in this mix are, in this kind of section are uh, bergamot, 
yeah, so we have ironweed, um, there's oxide, there is some late figwort that's already um, pretty much going to seed right next to Jake. Here. There's also Canada wild rye that is just about to head out. Um, but basically the composition of these beetle banks is about 60% native bunch grasses and 40% wildflowers. Historically, uh, beetle banks have always been basically 100% native bunch grasses because that provides the best structure for ground beetles for overwintering and nesting. We are dabbling with diversifying that a little bit, adding a wildflower component to then support pollinators as well as beneficial insects and the beneficial insects that maybe as larvae are predaceous, but once they complete metamorphosis, they are then pollinators such as um, hoverflies. Uh, they can be burned. This one was with um, a bed shape tiller and that works. Otherwise you can plow two reverse furrows. They can be planted on flat ground too, if that's not an option for you. Basically the key thing is to make sure that it's a well-drained area that's important for ground beetles. And the advantage of having it burned is so that it can basically be drier earlier in the season, therefore encouraging the ground beetles and other beneficial insects to get out into crops sooner. Maybe Sarah, you can grab some of this blue stem and we can show what we mean by bench grass. Yeah, so unlike, for example, smooth brome, um, that is a sod forming grass, they are, they're bunchy. The, you know, this is kind of a bigger plant. There are smaller ones like little blue stem that make it look even more um, obvious, but they, you know, are kind of contained into the space. Um, so they may, like big blue stem, Indian grass, they can get um, eventually later in life to be more rhizomious and can, you know, kind of over dominate areas, but by and large are considered native bunch grasses. And um, yeah, just, that's probably the best example we have here. Or actually, there's some space here so you can really see the growth form between there. So Jake, you mentioned, um, you know, your potatoes here and the potato beetle, and I know that pest control is one of the reasons why, you know, you said you installed these beetle banks. I think we have a link to a map of how the beetle banks are laid out. So maybe Jason, you can put that in the chat and people can kind of see how the beetle banks are laid out. We're at the blue X on that map. Mm -hmm. um, but why don't you talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the potato beetle and, you know, why you planted, because there's also, I know, a strip over here, why you kind of planted these here particularly. Yeah. So again, going back to the idea that the beetles are only going to go so far. So you want to try to think about uh, when you're positioning your beetle bank on your farm as close to the field and as kind of uh, central to your farm operation as you can make it. That way they can either they can go in any direction um, into your crop fields around that area. So we have we this is our kind of our western block of fields here. So um, this is about two acres of, of ground here. And so we have them beetle banks running on the north and south, running north and south on both the west and the east side of this field. And then the other ones are positioned kind of perpendicular. They run east-west and it runs kind of right, right through the middle of our sort of our eastern block of fields. Um, and so again, that was just kind of to make it so that the, the beetles can go in whichever direction to still kind of give us a benefit here on the, within the cropping systems. So Sarah, Sarah just mentioned a couple of different ways you can build these. You have some equipment here that I think you use. Yeah. You wanna talk about that really yeah. quickly? So we, I, I guess when we kind of got into this, uh, having really no experience planting beetle banks or doing much with habitat, I felt kind of more comfortable just trying to make it as similar to our vegetable system as possible. And so that's why we decided to go with uh, planting plugs instead of growing, um, instead of going from seed. And that way we were able to just pretty much treat it like any other transplanted vegetable crop. It's a similarly sized bed. So I, I mentioned that we plant the rows are 15 inches apart and in row was a foot spacing. And so that was based on recommendations that Xerxes had about kind of ideal plant spacing for these type of plants. And so we use this, this is our water wheel transplanter. Again, it's kind of our, probably one of our most commonly used implements on the farm. It's what we use to transplant um, all of our vegetable crops. And so these trays, are where you would set your, your uh, plants on. 
and then two people can sit on the back here and plant as you go down the bed. And these two drums are what, uh, these roll on the ground and these kind of duck bill teeth here is what marks the, kind of where the plant's supposed to go and it makes a little dibble in the, in the soil. And so again, these, there's three rows here. Um, so the outside rows uh, are 30 inches apart and then there's a middle row that's 15 inches apart. And then each one of these little duck bills are uh, six inches apart, so we just, skip one and then we are able to plant foot spacing on this. And so the, Sarah mentioned the, the whole beetle bank mix was 60% grasses and 40% forbs. But even within that, it's really primarily, you might have told me on this, June grass, little blue stem, and prairie drop seed. It's yes. probably like, I don't know, a large proportion of the entire thing. Yes. So what we did is just had two of our staff and then one person driving and just drove down the bed and just planted those crops. So we had most of the planting done just using this piece of machinery here. And then within our, our forb species and a couple of our other grasses, we just had maybe one or two trays of each. So like, you know, 30 to 60 plants. And that, those were kind of just plugged in where we left gaps when we planted with the water wheel transplanter. And so we had a group of volunteers that came and helped us plant those. So that's planting stuff. Yeah. And then this is what we used. So we planted in August. Uh, yeah, the last week of August. So um, the idea there is we wanted to have an, a little bit of time that we could be doing weed management during that same year of planting. Um, and so again, going back to trying to make it as similar to our normal production system as possible, this is our uh, Case 265 tractor. Uh, it's our main cultivating tractor. It's got a belly mount, Let me go over here that's set up with um, Tillmore finger weeders that's on a three bed, three row bed system. And so we were able to use these finger weeders to just cultivate the habitat. And uh, we were able to kind of knock back a lot of the common annuals that pop up in our fields like uh, pigweed and purslane um, and really knock those back in that first year. And then all we had to worry about moving forward in the subsequent years was those kind of nasty um, deep taproot, more perennial weeds that come up that we like mare's tail and there's a bunch of prickly lettuce in there now and some, and some thistle that's coming up too. So this was really, um, really helpful in that first year of establishment to just kind of get a good couple passes of weed management in before the winter. So speaking of weeds, maybe we can walk over here and you can point out some of those weeds. Yeah. And maybe Jake, you can talk about uh, some of the any establishment challenges you've had or kind of what you've had to do to keep these uh, growing and functioning like they should. Yeah, so the, I, I would say probably the main challenge, each, I've, each beetle bank has been different, really. There's some that are, like this one has a really strong, tall stature plant and has kind of some struggles with some of the shorter stature plants. Others are the opposite. Um, so each one, just based on where they are on the farm and the existing weed pressure that's in those areas, it seems like they're all a little bit different and kind of how wet the soil is or, or all, all those kinds of factors. The one big issue that was a, a, a pretty key mistake on my part in the first year is we had previously uh, broadcast seeded our cover crops. And so in this field, realizing I didn't want to get cover crop seed in the beetle bank, I tried to go over as far away from them as possible, but also still get good coverage on the cover crops in this field. Um, but of course, you probably know where this is going. I, I uh, spread some uh, rye and vetch seed into this beetle bank. Uh, the rye has pretty much gone away. You see a couple stragglers in here, but the vetch, uh, which is this plant that Sarah's holding, um, we just ended up ripping it all out. And it wasn't too terrible, but it was still kind of a pain. Um, yeah, it was very viney yeah. and matted everything down and basically shaded everything out. Um, but we can see there's smooth brome um, creeping in, which is very, very common, any size planting. Mare's tail, this is an annual native. That's also very common. Um, large scale planting, small scale plantings. A lot of people get kind of worried about it. It can get very tall. It kind of looks as if it's taking over, but on the threshold of weeds, it's definitely um, at the bottom and low octane, not really an issue. Um, but they did, you had significant mare's yeah. tail um, that first full growing season. Canada thistle is present. You know, there's some clover that's creeping in. Um, you know, all your Kentucky bluegrass, things of that nature, all common weeds with native plantings. So now in the second year and even last year too, um, 
because it's because it has a, such a high forb quant, uh, quantity, I guess, in the mix, we weren't able to just mow it so consistently because we wanted those forbs to develop, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we came in and did a lot of work with string trimming, just kind of being a little bit more precise around the plants as best we could, try to keep the forbs, you know, as they are, but knock back the weeds that are around them. Yeah, and this particular um, beetle bank project is quite large. So also trying to be creative and finding ways to deal with weed management without having to use labor and resources of just hand pulling, uh, which is really excessive and time consuming. And um, they're doing a lot here. So as much as they can mitigate, that's been really helpful. Yeah. And it's just important to not allow those weeds to go to seed. Um, that's the main thing. And for perennials, you're going to have to consistently be fighting that for a while until things really get established. We have a question here in the chat from JC. JC asked, did you survey for insect diversity density before planting? How will you monitor success? And maybe we can talk about that generally, and then we can go down here and talk about some of the current survey work yeah. we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really great question, JC. Um, we did actually do some pre-planting ground beetle monitoring with Luther College. Um, we got the interest of Dr. Kirk Larson up at Luther, who is one of Iowa's you know, really uh, well-known ground beetle experts. And in 2019, one week in June, and then one week towards the end of July into August, they deployed pitfall traps there were three in each beetle bank and three into the crop fields. I think they were 20 to 30 meters into the crop fields. And basically we just wanted to see, um, are there beetles, ground beetles already here? So it's just that preliminary pre-planting population assessment. Uh, we did this on four different farms, uh, one control, three new plantings. And we found with those results that there were over 1600 individual um, individuals on the farms and 48 different species of ground beetles. Um, and that's really important. We want to know, uh, are we supporting ground beetles? Are they going into crop fields? Are they providing those ecosystem services that we expect of them? And basically, you know, are we supporting them? Unfortunately, we are kind of postponing that research due to funding and capacity, but we have intentions of uh, picking that back up and doing more research. So anecdotally, Jake, have you noticed any pest control in your fiddle crops or still pretty early for that? Well, just this spring we saw the, was it two spotted? Two spotted stink bug. Two spotted stink bug. It's kind of like a red, uh, very deep colored red with some kind of like black, it kind of looks like a face on its like shield on its back. Um, and that's a kind of a known potato beetle, a Colorado potato beetle predator. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen those kind of a higher population than I've seen in the past out in the potato field this year. But I think really, you know, so we're in the, this is the second, yeah, second full season of kind of establishment. And I, I don't think we would really anticipate seeing a significant bump in these kind of predaceous ground beetles for another maybe year or two, something like that. Because I think the, the going to start really thriving is, are really just coming to kind of be a solid stand, I think. So it takes time. Well, let's walk down here. I mean, I, I maybe you caught a glimpse on camera, but I can see this tent looking thing down here. Yeah. Well, we're walking down here. Sarah, you mentioned, you know, this is pretty grass heavy. That's different than something you might plant specifically for pollinators. But I also know there's a lot of bees and butterflies around. So maybe you can talk about the plants in here that are still going to benefit pollinators. Yeah. Um, so again, we're kind of experimenting with that because traditionally um, it's always been 100% native bunch grasses. Um, but certainly there are plenty of beneficial insects that um, benefit from wildflowers. So this is golden Alexander. It's a spring blooming species. Um, so it was in bloom and is now just beginning to senesce and set seed here very soon. Um, this is prairie coreopsis. And basically how much diversity can we, can we support? Um, obviously we want that pest control, but if we can you know, hit two birds with one stone or get multiple benefits. Uh, that kind of seems like a no brainer to us. And onto the field banks, the 13 acre pollinator habitat out this way and their cover crop um, system, there are a lot of foraging options for pollinators on this farm. Yeah. So let's go over here and talk and yeah. then we can talk about the resources that are available at different times on the farm. 
You want to dive into this? Yeah, let's talk about this first. So the based on a trial that I worked with Jorgen on last year here to uh, kind of identify and assess the existing nectar resources on the farm throughout the season, we came out every two weeks uh, from May to October and just looked at what flowers were blooming at 10 different sites along the farm. And so that kind of just really piqued our interest in looking at more pollinator health um, uh, and kind of the movement of pollinators around the farm. And so this year we're collaborating with uh, Dr. Andrew Forbes and uh, one of our staff, Kayla Carter, are working on this project to use these, these are called malaise traps. And these are used to catch flying insects, mostly small flying insects. You don't usually catch uh, bumblebees or anything larger like that, or beetles with this kind of setup. Um, but it'll give us a good idea of like parasitoids and other kind of flying insects like that. So they they will, as they fly north and south, they're kind of lower lower hovering. They're going to hit this black mesh wall underneath, and then they are kind of evolved to go towards the light. So they're going to move up towards the sun through this light, um, this white colored mesh here, and then they get. Once they get to the peak here, they get caught. Well, there's a sample tube in here. They get caught and then they drop down into this um, collection vial of um, uh, alcohol. And so we have three of these set up on the farm in different kinds of, I guess, habitats or ecosystems, whatever you want to call it. So this is one that's in kind of our cultivated areas. And then we have a couple more that are in the pollinator area. So we're looking to see, you know, our how are there different kinds of species in these different areas, even though they're only maybe 100 yards away from each other, uh, just based on the plants that are growing and blooming in the, in the different spaces? Um, do they start there and move here over time? Um, so this is gonna be going on the rest of the, the season here, and we'll just kind of see what we find out after identifying the bugs that we collect throughout the year. Great. Well, let's maybe slowly make our way yeah. down here to the pollinator planting. But while we're walking, Jake, why don't you talk a little bit more about the research that you did to kind of map where the nectar resources are on the farm and maybe talk about a little bit about what you learned. Yeah, so we um, we figured out 10 zones um, that are again kind of different types of spaces on the farm. So we have uh, some of the near some of the habitat areas in some of the different types of cropping systems. So we have big fields of potatoes, big fields of melons that all have different flowers that they um, that bloom at different times of the year. We have kind of more grassy side fields and then we have kind of the more pollinator heavy plantings. And then we have some wooded areas. So we identified these different zones and then I would just go around and, and stand in those zones, look around as far as I could see in that area and identify um, you know what, flower, what color flowers are blooming and a kind of a, a general quantity. Um, and so I mean, I think I, what I assumed I'd see is more of these native flowers that we're planting, but I, I think what I end up being more surprised about is how, how much um, uh, dandelions and white clovers provide value, and then some of these crop types, some of these crop fields that bloom, you know, provide floral nectar resources on the farm too. And then cover crop fields like this, this is a well-timed field day because the, the field peas in this cover crop field, this is an oat and pea, um, uh, cover crop field. This is going to be carrots here in a couple weeks. Uh, and these just kind of are all started blooming over the last week. Um, so this is another, I mean, so we're going to be, the bloom time is kind of when we start thinking about terminating, but you can see how many, maybe you can't see, but there's tons of bumblebees all over the place, all these little pink flowers and butterflies. Highlight here. Um, make it you can get in. So yeah, there's Bumblebees, there's a big bumblebee. What kind of bumblebees would we be seeing, Sarah? Um, so a lot, I'd say the more common bumblebees are common eastern bumblebee, two-spotted bumblebee, brown-belted bumblebee. Um, this here is a two-spotted bumblebee. And it looks quite large, so I would say that's still a queen that is flying around who overwintered. Don't want to keep them in the vial for too long on a hot day. Um, but I think just eyeing this, there's probably at least three different species foraging here. Um, there's a ton of butterflies on the farm. Here is a worker bee. So this is a female 
that is collecting pollen. You can see it on her pollen sacks. If I can get her to come up. And I'm going to guess two spotted, although could be brown belted. Uh, but we're going to let her continue on her day. So Jake, especially early in the year, I mean, I think your research pretty clearly demonstrated these kind of ephemeral annual yeah. flowers are pretty important. Yeah. So the big pollinator, the natives are really just turning on. I think the, you know, Golden Alexander's is kind of the early outlier that, you know, blooms really early in the season. But things like this and even the, the hairy vetch that we grow in our other cover crop fields, I think some of those when you know we plant them for the soil health benefits but they also provide these habitat benefits as well and when the vetch is in full bloom there's um, there's bumblebees all over that too so i think these kinds of this cover crops can be just another element of the habitat and pollinator support um, and even you know ground dwelling bugs are going to be happy underneath that canopy too especially on a hot day yeah. hot and dry day like this I also can hear the red winged blackbirds, and I've seen the barn swallows, I can hear the killdeer, so the birds like all the insects too. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I saw a dick thistle here last week, Yeah. Um, so it's very, very cool what they have going on here. Yeah. So let's walk down here to the big planting. Yep. So I guess I can chit chat about this. So in 2018, yeah. in the fall, um, 13 acres were planted to a pollinator palooza mix, which is a pre-made mix from Prairie Moon um, that we Xerces partnered with to basically ensure that it is, you know, a Cadillac pollinator mix. Um, so it's really high diversity. Um, I believe it's at least 25% um, grasses and 75% flowers, if not a little more wildflowers. Um, I did not brush up on the exacts of that seed mix. It was mowed um, traditionally a few times that first year, and it is my understanding that uh, Johnson County, um, I assume the Conservation Board, yep. uh, manages this site. So Grow Johnson County is not um, necessarily responsible for it, but they are sure reaping the benefits. Absolutely. And there are several species blooming currently. So we have, um, let's see, we just walked by some, but let's pull it down. So this one is another spring bloomer. It doesn't look like much at the moment. It's a spiderwort species. In the very early mornings, it will bloom and look really gorgeous. But as the day goes on and the heat increases, they actually close up and they reserve those resources. And once temperatures and things cool down, they will open up again. Just want to open up right there, right? Oh yeah. So that's a really important spring species. Um, what has really blossomed over the last couple of days since we were here is the foxglove penstemon, which is this white flower. Um, bees with very long tongues, bumblebees especially, um, carpenter bees I've seen foraging on these quite a bit. Uh, really utilize that plant. We have Western Yarrow, which is another early plant. There's more Golden Alexanders. Here we have a soldier be or milkweed beetle. Anyway, I'm not an entomologist, but there's a beetle <laughs> foraging on this oxi. So this is kind of our early summer, really, in some cases goes all through the summer. Um, and occasionally into the fall and blooms. So fall sunflower and or oxeye. So it's kind of cool that we're getting to that moment where we're kind of transitioning from spring species into the summer species. So I think the obvious thing to me when I stand here is how many more flowers I see than in the beetle banks. Mm -hmm. Yes. A spider on your shoulder. Right oh, I do. <laughs> little uh, daddy long legs. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about what this mix looks like compared to what that what's planted in those field banks. Obviously yeah. there's more flowers. How many flowers are we talking about generally? Yeah, so there's at least 75% wildflowers, 25% grasses. So it's almost like a complete reverse opposite um, in comparison to the beetle banks. So the beetle bank species composition is really to provide that nesting and overwintering shelter for ground beetles, hence more grasses. Um, here 
It is much more diverse to basically draw in as many insects and wildlife um, species as possible. So we have um, species that are blooming throughout spring, summer, and fall. So we're hitting all of those bloom periods, which is really, really important. And we also have species from, you know, different genera, different families. You're going to support more insects with the more diversity you have in that regard. So as many different flowering species as possible. Um, there are host plants for certain um, Lepidoptera. You know, we think a lot about milkweed and monarchs but golden alexanders um, are great for swallowtails. That's a host plant. Um, the, you know, the grasses are also host plants for um, a large amount of moths and butterflies. So we can't not include them, um, but there's also that huge difference in ratio uh, to provide more space and open ground cover for ground nesting bees. So the beetle banks, Jake, I mean, you've designed those specifically for predatory beetles yeah. for pest control. But I mean, the farm also benefits from the pollinators. Absolutely. Right? So maybe you can talk about some of your crops that are insect pollinated and how that's important to your farm. Yeah, I mean, uh, the one that's always really obvious to me is the anything in the cucurbit family. Uh, we have our fields of winter squash and, and melons together, and it, there's kind of that time when they all, those big, uh, yellow flowers open up and it almost seems like when you're out there that every single flower has a big bumblebee in it. Um, uh, you know, peppers as well, uh, tomatoes, um, all can be, can be wind pollinated but also benefit from, from um, insect pollination as well. Yeah. JC asked another question here in the chat, uh, what is the source for the prairie mix? So maybe let's back up and talk mm -hmm. about the source for the plugs. Yeah. And then we can talk about seed sourcing seed generally. So yeah. I don't know if you want to talk about how, or either of you talk about how you source the plugs for the beetle banks, and maybe talk a little bit about cost. Yeah, yeah. We looked at a few different options um, and ended up going with uh, Minnesota Native Landscape, which I think just changed their name to MNL now. It's just an acronym. Okay. <laughs> but then that's for the plugs. For the plugs, <laughs> yes, for the plugs. Um, and and maybe maybe a, what a, talk a little bit about what a plug actually is. Yeah, plug is they came as they were what two inch plugs, right? Um, and so there was uh, 36 cell trays, uh, 36 plants per tray um, in two inch plugs for most of these. I think we had some that were four inch plugs too. Um, but yeah, the plug is just a, a transplant. You know, the plant has been grown in the greenhouse, and it's a, it's kind of got a a nice uh, um, potting mix space for the for the root to develop in yeah the roots are already established it's basically a small plant so it doesn't take as much time to establish and begin to grow as you could see some of that big blue stems doing really well yeah and then um, more expensive though than from seed yes yeah, so the plant material for plugs um, is going to cost more. They range anywhere from like a dollar ten upwards to three dollars a plant, depending on who you're working with. So initially, that upfront cost can seem rather daunting, um, but you reap the benefits and quicker establishment. Um, potentially doing less site prep because they don't have to compete as much versus um, drawing from seed. And it's a smaller scale planting where it's feasible uh, to do that with 13 acres. Um, it's a no-brainer to use seed or, you know, anything, maybe half acre or more, quarter acre or more. Um, and then the seed for this particular planting was sourced from Prairie Moon, which is in southern Minnesota. So two Minnesota vendors um, here. And again, that was a pre-custom, or not custom, well, a pre, like a canned mix that they sell. Um, anyone can buy a pollinator palooza mix. Um, and it's very, very diverse. And again, they partnered with us to basically create that mix and give it our green light. And we actually have a link, uh, Jason, maybe you can put the link to the Tallgrass Prairie Center in the chat, but the Tallgrass Prairie Center at the University of Northern Iowa maintains a list of prairie service and seed vendors. So that is a good resource if you're looking for either services or seed. Yes, so they have um, a contractor list that can go over whether assistance for site prep, assistance for planting, assistance for seed, um, establishment mowing, burning, etc. Um, the Tallgrass Prairie Center's website is a really great resource for a lot of things. If you're curious about making your own custom mix, there's a native seed calculator that you can tool around with. Um, excellent resource, highly recommend it. So we talked about management of the uh, 
Beetle Banks a little bit. Sarah, do you want to talk about management of prairie generally? Yeah. Oh, Jake, the you the farm, Grow Johnson County doesn't actually manage this. Right. We just benefit from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this planting is going to be managed a lot differently than smaller um, plug plantings. Basically, it's going to be treated like any prairie and that it was, you know, planted with seed in the fall, so a dormant planting in 2018, so the summer of 2019, it was mowed and it needs to be mowed. So basically, um, in order for the seed to germinate and establish, it needs to have light and it needs to not be buried. So typically we advise folks that once vegetation gets roughly knee high, it needs to be mowed down to ankle high um, or about 18 inches needs to be mowed down to six or eight. Um, sometimes that can be difficult depending on what your equipment setup is. So those can be adjusted as necessary, but really, really important to do those establishment mowings, ideally three times in the growing season if mother nature allows. Um, it helps to knock back all the annual weeds, prevents things from going to seed, ensures that there's light getting down to the seedlings, um, and just gives them an opportunity to establish. Prairie plants spend the first year or two establishing roots, so you might not see much above ground those first couple of years. Um, a little tidbit that I heard that I love to share with people is that prairie will, in the first year it will sleep, in the second year it will creep, and in the third year it will leap. And so, yeah, this is beginning to leap. We're in the, the, the leap year. <laughs> and, uh, but as you can see, it's not, uh, it's not free of weed pressure. Um, you still have to keep up on it. And they didn't mow um, the second growing season, but sometimes that's necessary if the weed pressure is there. Mm -hmm. And then moving forward, likely going to manage with fire periodically. And this was former conventional crop ground, which, okay. and so that, plays a role in the clean seed, the cleanish seed bed potentially, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. So converting um, from crop ground to a prairie is generally easier because that weed seed bank has just been, you know, annihilated over the years and the pressure's quite low. Whereas converting from like a hay field to a prairie or just idle ground of smooth brome or other um, non-native perennial vegetation can be a little more challenging. JC asked another great question. Um, how was this site chosen on the farm? And maybe, mm -hmm. Jason, we can put the map, the link to the map back up. But maybe, Jake, you can talk about the layout here. And then, Sarah, you can talk about life cycle of some of our bumblebees. Because it's pretty cool. Okay. We have the woods kind of here behind us and the prairie planting and then some of the production fields over here. So yeah. maybe talk about, was that layout intentional? And then maybe you can talk about life cycle a little bit. Sure. So. Yeah, this tends to be, as a whole, this tends to be the more kind of rolling, sloping, I'm not sure if you can catch, catch this on video, but there's a lot of kind of just like rolling hills that we look out on. And so there's just waterways that come down to the, to the woods from up on the, the plateau closer to the buildings. And so it was, you know, it's not ideal crop ground we can maybe put this into a more perennial cover and provide some additional erosion control. Um, it also is situated close to where there's a lot more vegetable production that would benefit from, you know, a healthy pollinator population. And then like Jorgen mentioned, just the proximity to the, to the, the wood, the wood, woodland habitat or, you know, kind of tree cover um, could potentially provide additional kind of collaborative resources per, for habitat with uh, nectar resources. Yeah, and so pollinators, um, I'll talk specifically about bumblebees, they tend to nest or can nest in this situation. So queens from the year before will emerge in the early spring. Um, they'll likely forage quite a bit within woodlands, um, spring ephemerals especially because those are some of our earliest nectar resources or um, trees and shrubs that bloom a lot sooner than our um, native prairie species but they will emerge from overwintering. Um, they will diligently compete for nest sites. So they will move out of potentially a woodland edge area or a woodland habitat and look for nesting sites elsewhere. Um, they will build their colony. This time within the last probably two weeks, we're just now starting to get reports of worker bees. We saw a worker bumblebee earlier. 
um, so that their colonies are thriving now and throughout the season those queens that emerge from the winter will die off um, new queens will emerge males will emerge they will mate males will die off workers will die off and that new mated queen will then go back hibernate for the winter over winter and then start a new colony again um, so it's important to have basically a, a mosaic of habitat available um, there's still a lot that we don't know about overwintering bumblebees but um, basically we can assume that a lot of them are utilizing kind of the woodland edge habitats for overwintering we have just a few minutes left i have two things left i want to talk to you about and there's a question in the chat i want to get to so uh, liz asked in the chat about canada thistle i also want to ask about wild parsnips because that is a plant that looks pretty similar to this golden alexander so maybe yes. you can uh, talk sarah about managing some of those problem species how to identify those two in yeah. two minutes yeah so common um kind of nightmare species for for everyone is canada thistle so it's a exotic thistle, it is perennial, it reproduces via seed and an extensive root system. So it can be um, really problematic and basically you need to interrupt seed production as much as possible. Um, there is anecdotally evidence that suggests cutting it six inches or less actually encourages the root growth. So I do not recommend that, um, but you will have to either spray and or cut and remove um, the seed head and likely do that multiple times throughout the growing season because it will want to come back. We I all tell a Canada thistle from some of our native thistles. Yeah, so Canada thistle looks very similar to um, our native field thistle, but it does not have white on the underside. And I'm just quickly glancing to see if I can see a native thistle. There was one earlier. Um, it's very pokey, but it looks similar, but the heads are also, they have multiple flowers. They're quite tiny. Um, our native thistles have a larger flower head and sometimes it's a single flower head. Sometimes it has some branches. This is actually another um, exotic species, the bull thistle. It is not as bad, but it's not favorable. Um, so a similar, similar thing where it needs to not go to seed. And then wild parsnip, which is definitely on the farm and in a lot of roadsides at the moment. Um, but I'm not currently seeing anything but golden Alexanders, which is good. Maybe just talk really briefly about what to watch out for for Yes, so let's see. So wild parsnip is bad because it has oils that can get on your skin. And when you are exposed to the sun, they will make you itch and irritated and sometimes can be worse than poison ivy. Um, it looks similar to golden alexanders. They have yellow umbels such as this. They're in the same family. They're both the carrot family. The umbels are larger. The leaves are also larger. They're more lobed. These are very serrated. Um, and basically this is like all around just quite smaller than wild parsnip. Parsnip can also be um, as tall as me, I'm 5'5", five five, or you know, as tall or taller, so that's a pretty big difference. Golden Alexander doesn't typically get that tall. Um, and the stem is rather dainty in comparison. It's pretty thin and wild parsnip will have potentially more of a stout at full maturity, um, a thicker stem. But they do look similar, but they're not the same. <laughs> so JC asked a great question I want to close with here about is, uh, whether this is enrolled in CRP or any other type of program. Mm. No, it's not, not enrolled in CRP. This is, uh, to my knowledge, being a county owned property that the, the I was included in the kind of the county budget. Yeah. Yes, and but, this is also um, considered public land. So we cannot use cost share or um, those sorts of fundings on public land generally and yeah do you want me to yeah i mean sarah your title is farm bill pollinator conservation planner so maybe really quickly uh, where can people go for resources and then jason has a couple links i think you can put in the chat for folks yeah so thanks for hanging with us if you still are apologize farm bill programs um basically the federal government 
offers cost share like the Conservation Reserve Program CRP to um, get some kickback for taking land out of production, putting it into something very similar to this. There's also the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, uh, much different, that's administered by NRCS as well as the conservation stewardship program. So there's multiple options out there for producers and your best bet is to go to your local USDA service center. And yes. JC, thank you for all of the great questions. <laughs> Jason should put in the link, uh, in the chat, a link to your service center locator. And then Iowa State Extension also has a website that has some good resources for finding the wildlife professionals in your county. He'll put that link in there. And then Sarah, I know that Xerxes has a bunch of resources. Yes. And guides, so we'll link to those too. Yeah, our website um, is daunting. There's a plethora of things. If you go to the publication library, you can search by region, uh, publication type, topic, etc. Great. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. I want to thank you both, Jake and Sarah, for spending the morning with us out here on the farm. I appreciate your time and your expertise this morning. Jake, any closing thoughts about anything we've talked about? Any next steps for the farm here? Um, next steps for the farm, I think we're going to continue to be maintaining, uh, doing maintenance on the beetle banks to try to get those natives to compete the, the invasive, the weeds. Um, same thing down here, just continue to support it and get it to a point where it's really thriving and providing space for pollinators. Um, I think just my closing thing is just if you're looking at putting habitat on your farm, uh, just be thinking about all those different sections of your farm that can benefit from having even something like a, a flowering cover crops or even putting annual flowers out in your vegetable fields too. Um, it all helps to support the, the ecosystem on the farm. Great. Well, on that great note, everyone, I want to thank all our viewers for tuning in today. We appreciate your time. Um, we would love to hear your feedback. That evaluation link is in the YouTube video description. So make sure you click that link, take a few minutes, tell us what you thought about this. Uh, live from the farm field day we would really appreciate that a little bit about pfi practical farmers of iowa is a member-based organization uh, working across iowa and in surrounding states with the mission to equip farmers to build resilient farms and communities we do that in a few different ways but we really specialize in farmer to farmer learning and farmer-led on-farm research uh, whether you grow corn or soybeans or carrots or cut flowers or raise livestock uh, all are welcome to practical farmers i really encourage you all to check out our website practicalfarmers.org to learn more about the resources that we offer and some of our programming. I wanna thank uh, some of our sponsors, Johnson County Public Health and Farming for Public Health for sponsoring this field day. I wanna thank uh, Iowa Valley RCD and Grow Johnson County and Xerxes Society for lending their expertise here. And I wanna thank uh, the US Department of Agriculture Natural Resources Conservation Service for their support through a conservation innovation grant. Um, next, next time, uh, next week, make sure you join us. We'll be live from the farm of Tom and Irene Franson to talk about Tom's innovative uh, practical farrowing box for pigs, and I think the patent's pending on the term there. But until next week, so long from the farm. Thank you. <laughs>